Want to be a VR producer? Then this episode is for you. So let's get to it. You are listening to the How to Create VR podcast, weekly conversations with VR and AR professional creators, designers, and producers. Hello and welcome to another episode of the How to Create VR podcast, where I speak with professional creators, designers, developers, and producers who work on VR, AR, and MR projects. I'm Marcelo Lewin, an immersive content specialist focused on e-learning and training. I'm also the creator and the guy behind HowToCreateVR.com. My guest is Adam Bruce, a producer of various VR experiences, including a Steven Spielberg-backed venture and his latest project, producing the LBE VR experience, The Blue. Today, Adam will give us tips, tricks, and lots of information about what a VR producer does. But before we get started, I want to remind you to register at howtocreatevr.com. It's free and registration gives you access to all our live events, tutorials, practice assets, podcast interviews, videos, and more. It's quick and easy. Just visit howtocreatevr.com and click on the register for free button. Finally, if you want to attend our live events in virtual reality, join us inside Altspace VR. Just visit howtocreatevr.com forward slash Altspace VR and subscribe to our channel. All right, Adam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Marcel. Happy to be here. I'm glad to have you here. I found out about you and being the producer of the VR experience, The Blue. Now, to make sure we're clear on this, there is the desktop version, which is what I've experienced. And then there's also the LBE version, right? Which I'm assuming is based on the desktop version. It is. It takes where the desktop version left off and brings it to a consumer entertainment center at the Westfield Century City Mall. I see. It's a communal multiplayer experience. And whereas the original Blue was just sort of a solo thing, this is something that you could actually experience with your friends and family. Well, we're going to get into a little bit about that. But before we do, why don't you just give us a quick wrap up of your background? How did you get to be a VR producer? (laughs) Well, I've been doing interactive for two decades. And I started off doing learning management systems right when client server learning systems were becoming new and people were starting to learn how to interact with people. And about five years ago, when VR came out, I definitely saw that as the next wave of emerging technology. And it's something I've always been very passionate about. And I was lucky to get involved with a team over at Dodo Case to create an early experience for their cardboard VR project. And really, I've just been in love with it ever since. So it's kind of a part of an overarching theme of my work taking early adopter technologies and streamlining them for broad consumer consumption. Do you remember the first VR experience you experienced? Oh, you know, I can't remember exactly when the date was, but I saw it at an arcade experience many, many decades ago called Dactyl Nightmare. And And it was very early. The frame rates were terrible. The resolution was awful, but it did just give kind of the faintest glimpse of where the tech was going to go. And I've been so excited about it ever since that when Oculus Rift came onto the scene five years ago, it finally got me. I'm like, oh, gosh, it's here. Finally, you know what the promise of Dactyl Nightmare is now made real. So it made a very deep impression in me that I'm happy to put me on the path I'm on now. What's your favorite VR experience as of today? I would say that the one I spend the most time in is probably my favorite, and that's Elite Dangerous. I've been playing that one ever since 2015. You know, they've made a lot of updates to it. And it's one of those VR worlds that's a mile wide and a mile deep. You can just go completely into it. And as a lover of astronomy, a big Carl Sagan aficionado, Elite Dangerous is kind of my ultimate VR experience because I could go see the universe in a one-to-one scale. It's just a, you know an amazing experience. Yeah, definitely. What HMD do you currently use today? Well, it really depends on what I'm doing. I have all the major ones. I have a Vive I use for development. I use a Rift for most of my consumer experience is just from ease of use and comfort. I have had all the Gear VRs as they've come out because I've done a lot of development for those. But I'm really most looking forward to this new wave mobile tetherless products like the Vive Cosmos and the Oculus Quest. I think that that's going to be a real breakout for the industry. So I can't wait to get my hands on that and start building for it. And the Vive Pro I, that one is kind of cool too. I tried that one with the eye tracking capabilities. I tell you, eye tracking is one of the most underrated technologies in VR. I first got exposed to that at SVVR with Fove. And the feeling of having my eyes tracked, it was like the freedom I experienced the first time I used a mouse. You know, it's not really necessarily about the hardware. The eye tracking is a pretty basic technology. It's been out for a while. 
But the software that we're going to be able to build from this is going to really take VR to the next level. From a training perspective, eye tracking is huge, right? It is. And just knowing where the user is giving attention, not only can you do great art tricks with it, like you know, rack focusing or the like, but you also apply interesting mechanics. You know, having an NPC in the environment recognize or being looked directly at and then responding. And that kind of one-to-one interaction, you really only get with eye contact. So I think that experiences like even Altspace VR and VR chat are going to really, really up the immersion game when they start to bring these technologies in. Well, and the ability to do branching without the user knowing that we're branching based on where they looked inside the sphere. And you can, based on where they're looking, send them to a different place and the story could be different every single time, right? That definitely helps the replayability. Yeah. Definitely. Cool. So why don't we start with this? Why don't we start with you defining what is a VR producer? Like, tell us, what does a VR producer do at the basic level? At the basic level, the VR producer makes sure that the experience is produced. And that typically means published. You know, it's not enough to create some demo that you and your friends who built the project could experience. You fundamentally have to ship it to an end user. And that's the primary responsibility. But the way you get there is by assisting the director to make sure their vision is brought to market. And that means that you got to wear all the hats. You're kind of like the chief operations officer of a startup, a COO. And your job is to make sure that CEO vision is carried to an end user. That means everything from managing the budget to hiring to firing to making contracts, but also understanding the technical challenges of the project, understanding what's needed next, even how to produce things, what expertise on the project needs to get filled. So you're really a jack of all trades, but a master of shipping. But that means also as a producer, you need to know a lot. And what I mean by that is not just project management, how to develop a product, but also maybe even being a developer kind of helps, right? I have a subjective bias there because I come from development and my production style is very much a technical producer. Other types of producers, you know, come from product marketing and they understand different skill set. And sometimes their projects, you know, look a little different because of that. But for me, what I find has been helpful is, you know, having been a 3D artist, I understand the challenges of making sure that art is performant, figure out where the attention to detail needs to be put on hero assets and understanding kind of what the needs of the animators and the artists and the engineers are really trying to communicate to you. Do we need to bring on more talent? Do we need to educate someone on the team for something? Having that background development for me has been helpful for the the in-the-trenches approach that typically take with my productions. And that also allows you to know what you can and most importantly, what you can't do. So when you're speaking with your stakeholders, you know what to promise and not promise, I would imagine. Well, yeah, because you represent the interest of the project at the end of the day. You have to set yourself aside, set your identity aside, and really kind of assume the identity of the product you're deploying. And you know the stakeholders all have their own interest at mind. The financial backers are looking for a return on their investment. The creatives are looking for a communication of their vision. You have to balance all this out. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, you got to ship this thing and ship it well. And so you really have to provide a little bit of a feedback mechanism to temper the creatives and say, that's great. Here's your area of scope. Temper the investors. Yes, if we wanted to return inside of this time, it needs to be this good. So it helps to kind of assume assume all of the needs of the project and then really listen to the feedback from the executive to see, is this thing possible? And sometimes you got to do the uncomfortable work of moving the ship around to avoid an iceberg that you didn't realize was coming along the way or go after an opportunity that the product has exposed as you've developed it, which is really something that occurs a lot with products that are on the horizon of the technology or emerging technology because a lot of the projects I work with have been within the first three or four years of the technology coming out. So a lot of times as the field is developing, we find what it needs to do along the way as we discover the capability. So you have to be very flexible. How do you avoid scope creep with people saying, especially your stakeholders or executives going like, oh, it would be great if we do this and let's add this and let's do this. How do you avoid and being able to still deliver on time, right? Right. Certainly. So scope creep is, you know, <laughs> I have a quote I'd like to share from an investor I worked with on one of my early startups. Jeremy Liu once told me that strategy is the application of limited resources to achieve an objective, because if you had unlimited resources, you could do everything. And that's really the case with scope creep. If you start to think, oh, we could do this. Oh, we could do that. Oh, we could do this. We could do that. You've got to get back to what is the goal of the project. And the, really the best way to define that goal is to start with the user and then work back to the technology, work back to the feature, work back to what the request is being asked of. Does it really serve the user persona? 
that the product is designed to be delivered to. If you're building a product that's targeting a mother who is out there with her kids, having a communal experience with them, some uh, request may not be appropriate for that. You know, say, hey, can we have this giant explosion? Can we do this cool thing? Well, that isn't, the user is not going to appreciate that, so no. <laughs> or maybe it's that, oh, the user wants that, and that will help what the user wants. So defining your user is one of the best things you could do to define scope creep. And then if you pontificate a little bit more, the next thing would be to prioritize all your change requests. Yeah, I use a five category system to rank feature requests from one to five. And category one would be something that causes harm to the user or creates liability. Something that, you know, if you put it out there, you expose customer information and credit cards, you cannot have that happen. That's like a category one thing you have to address. Category two would be your A bug, something that breaks the experiences, causes a hard crash, something that would incomplete the experience make it so the experience can't be achieved. B, which is category three, is something that you could still get through the experience, but you're not getting there well. If something's broken, maybe your frame rate is off and your users are getting nauseous. Maybe the users are missing some of the major story points and not getting the narrative. C's, which are your fours, those are your more your candy requests, more things that are like, you should probably fix that light, that bake lighting, you should probably fix that one asset that still doesn't have a broken texture, but it's not necessarily going to destroy the experience. You probably don't want to ship one of those sea bugs. And then the fifth one, those are just pure candy. These are things that are Easter eggs, something the user may not even see, something even beyond the user's perception, like trying to tweak the 3D spatialized audio to the point where you could just get it just right, but barely beneath their level of perception. But when you have those five, the way of measuring the severity of a bug or the severity of a feature, and then you also have defined your end goal of who that user is, those two together create really good mileposts to your project to define what you should build and what you shouldn't build. Who gets to decide the definition of that feature severity and if this feature truly is that number that you just applied it? In other words, where I'm getting at is you as the producer get to say, no, this is a feature that we shouldn't go live yet because this is just going to break the whole experience. But then maybe Maybe the executive producer or the distributor or whoever says, no, we need to ship. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Who gets to decide that? When you're looking at the requests that are coming in, you got to think of what domain expertise is relevant to the request. So, for example, if someone says on the executive production team, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the user did such and such? Well, you got to run that past your game designer because they're going to be the one that understands the value of that request and how it will affect the user. It could also be something like adding some extra effects or whatever. Maybe your technical director needs to weigh in on how is that going to affect the overall performance because maybe you're not in frame rate and maybe your performance budget is really tight through a certain area. You just simply don't have the capacity to add extra features into a certain section of the experience. So fundamentally, this is where a producer's role is to kind of be an arbiter of the team and listen to the various people weighing in on what their area of specialty is. But at the end of the day, you know, the, really the team has to come together and agree on, here's our five categories of severity. And yeah, we agree that this animation request that the animator says is a three is definitely a three. So that's what I've seen. But a lot of times, too, you also have these executive production requests that are coming down, and those are coming from outside of the realm of the products. You know, technical capability, maybe the executive production team realizes that, oh, we have to market to a certain demographic, and we need to add these story elements in to make it really relevant to them. So the financial need, the future finance of the project requires this. So yes, it'll be hard to technically make that, but it's up to the team to figure out how to accommodate that. And you have to adjust and figure out how to serve that. So what design considerations do you have for an LBE versus, let's say, a at-home experience or even a mobile? Like we were talking at the beginning about standalones, right? Which would be more mobile VR now. It's definitely a different type of product. I mentioned earlier that I, I love Elite Dangerous. It's a great experience, but it takes hours to learn how to fly that spacecraft. And in an arcade setting, the user doesn't have hours to spend just learning how to play. So sometimes with at-home experiences, if you're catering towards a user that likes that highly technical flight simulator, you know, you could give them a lot of that complex user interface. And so just from a basic design stance, there are differences in how you build a product. But the big difference between LBE and at-home consumers is you also have different user roles. At a location-based experience, you have a dedicated operator whose job is to make sure and deliver a great experience to those users. Likewise, you also have agents that work for that operator that are handling the ticket sales at the front. They're setting up the event. 
They're making sure there's a steady stream of users coming through the experience. And maybe they have needs that have to be considered in the project as well. Maybe you can only have 15 minutes a window in order to accommodate the user flow that that agent's in need. You also have to think about the venue. Location-based experiences are location-based, and each venue has its own set of requirements. Some venues are restaurants, and their number one priority is to feed customers, and they really don't care necessarily that there's a DR team in the back delivering an arcade, but they do like to have a bunch of people coming through the store. So you have to think about what are all these different roles in a location-based experience, how do they fit together, and how is everyone's needs met? And at the end of the day, at home experience, the user is the operator. So the user has to take on the responsibility of operating their own equipment. And when you're building the product, you have to consider that into the design. You consider that into the consumption. And you know, it economically changes the flavor of how that experience is delivered. Well, that's really interesting because speaking strictly on the LBE side, when you're producing a game, there's the side, like you mentioned, of the operator where you have to create whatever controls they're going to need to get the game going. Then there's the game. Then maybe there is the pre-game experience that you've got to produce, right, before they even get into a game. And I'm thinking kind of like The Void, right? When you get to The Void, you watch a movie. I'm assuming you as a producer would be in charge of all of that. It really depends on the project. For example, on the Blue Deep Rescue, that was a partnership between Weaver, the owner of the Blue, and then Dreamscape, who was the theater who was going to show the blue. And Dreamscape was also showing two other experiences, Alien Zoo and Magic Protector. So the blue is just one of their three experiences that they're showing. So we had to work hand in hand with Dreamscape on the production of this product to make sure that it fit into the user flow that they designed. And so from a Dreamscape's perspective, the user is entering into the virtual realm as soon as they buy their ticket. They walk into an onboarding area. They see artifacts of the experience in the lounge while they're waiting for the experience to kind of get the user into this imaginative mindset. And then as they move into the area where they gear up and gear down, the agents who are about to deliver the users to the operators are pre-wiring them with information of like, okay, here, you put on your hand trackers, put on your feet trackers and get into this kind of magical mindset. So it's all about entering into the experience before the experience even starts. So as a producer, how do you QA all of that? Like you've got the game that you've got to QA to make sure it's working right. But also from the LBE side, you've got to QA the other app that does all the controls of how to set up the game. And then you've got the pre-game experience. How do you QA and make sure that everything works seamlessly. Got to play test it. And you, know, you cannot just play test a section and think you've experienced the whole thing. You have to actually walk into your experience as if you were a user, gear up, do the experience, come out, gear down, and then see the emotional state across the entire spectrum. You also have to use people who have never done it before. You got to put a lot of users in blind and pay attention to, oh, well, maybe their backpack wasn't on securely when they went into the experience and when they get in, because it's slung down, the tracker's weird and their avatar is off. And, oh, you know, we found an area where we have to look at the onboarding and make sure that we didn't miss something on the way. So it's really important to play test the whole system from the front door all the way through the experience and then out to the exit again. Do you use sprints when you're delivering the product as well? You know, sprints are kind of the breath of the production. You can think about it. You're building an entity and it breathes in and it breathes out. You do work, you evaluate the work. You make sure you then measure the work against the goal. And sprints are a really good way to create a rhythm of production for the team where they could be hard on production, they're building, 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 and then they can step back and they could analyze and review. And for development sprint, agile development is something that's being used across the board for development. VR is especially true because you always have to analyze your progress and sprints create a natural rhythm for that motion. Well, it allows you to be more agile, right? Like if you decide to change, you've only wasted two weeks of development and whatever you did. Can you explain a little bit more about sprints and how it works for those that aren't familiar with that? Certainly. So when you're doing a development of any feature or idea, you're doing like a scientific analysis, you're doing a test of your assumption. Let's say I assume that I'm going to add some feature and that feature is going to create this great dynamic experience. Well, it works perfect in your head, but you don't know if it's going to work or not when you actually build it. So you have to go do a sprint to go build that thing. Then you have to actually analyze your work and say, okay, we walked in with this sort of assumptions. We built that feature in a couple of weeks. We're now testing that feature. Did the feature achieve the goal? Yes, no. And that's a great opportunity for you to either persevere on with the feature or to pivot away from the feature because you could be wrong. <laughs> You're not 
some kind of omnipotent person who's always right. You have to walk in with humility to understand that some of your great ideas are terrible ideas. And you have to, at the end of these sprints, measure each of them and say, okay, this worked, that doesn't. Now let's set up the next sprint of work so that we can then measure the next result. We've been mainly focusing on like the production side of development as a producer. What about pre-production? Like during the design of the game, the design of the experience itself, how involved are you as a producer and what are your responsibilities there? I like to get involved as early as possible in the project because you really start to understand what the precipitating need of the project project is. Perhaps you're working for a venture and they're looking to develop one area of a market and you need to do research into that area to find out what user is going to be served. And this is a great opportunity for you to create the user persona. Who is your target audience? How easy are they going to be to market to? How hard are they going to be to get into VR? What pieces of friction are we going to have to overcome Outside the development of the project, what pieces of friction do we have to overcome in order to make onboard that person into the experience? So this is a good time to model the development economically, model the development, as well as economically model some of the product marketing that will have to be achieved so you can then figure out how big of a budget you're going to need for the main production so that you could both develop it and also market and deliver it. And so a lot of these design constraints come out of the pre-production work. And so it's really good to be involved early in the process. You know where the walls of the production are and then what your zone of play on the development is going to be. So are you normally brought in during pre-production in a VR experience? I am. And a lot of times I'll sit down with the investors and understand what their expectation is, what they're looking to get out of it. I'll understand from the creatives what they're trying to communicate into the market. I also need to understand what are the economic realities in play of the project, as well as access to talent the collective team is going to have. And then from that, you could really start to set expectations about what can be achieved, what we'll be able to do, and then set up timelines to do it. What's terrible is when you come in and all the pre-production has already been done and you're adhering to somebody else's schedule and you don't even know what their thinking was when they set some arbitrary date. Maybe that arbitrary date is because of some upcoming marketing convention that they have to be at. Well, you need to know that ahead of time. So it's good to understand both the constraints as well as what the logic was to come up with those constraints for the project. During our pre-interview conversation we had, you mentioned something about the MDA framework and how that affects the immersive design itself. Can you explain what the MDA framework is? So interactive product development is very different from linear media such as you know film and television because the user is a participant in the medium. And the MDA framework is a way of quantifying how to achieve your objective. You typically come into a project and say, we want some kind of aesthetic, that's the A in the MDA, that you want to achieve. Since say, maybe you want to create a product that has a narrative-driven experience or a fantasy-driven or a challenge-driven experience. But in order to achieve that aesthetic, you have to get there through the dynamic interaction of your mechanics. So looking at, say, Beat Saber is a great example of this. It's a challenge aesthetic. You get in there for the challenge of getting a better score than you had last time and getting really good at swinging those sabers. And that aesthetic of a challenge is created by the mechanic of slicing these boxes and the dynamics of it all working together. How does that feel at the end of the day? So with movies, you actually typically come in a different way. You say, okay, well, what story do you want to tell? What characters do we need to get there? What emotional beats do we have to hit along the way? And then you lay down the landmarks and you fill it in. But with interactive design, you got to think of what mechanics do we have the capability of building? What is the dynamic interaction of those? And then what aesthetic does that lend itself to? And MDA is a good framework for kind of putting some balance on that and then saying, okay, if we want to hit a narrative aesthetic, then we need to literally look at our mechanics and say, how do these mechanics lead to that dynamic interaction to actually tell a story? Because fundamentally, it's about the user applying these mechanics and then having some kind of result happen to them. Well, as I lead into my next question is, how important is agency? Is giving the user agency always an important thing? Or is finding the right balance where they have full control versus not having control at all? Well, there's some very successful games actually have as their aesthetic submission. Submission is a very valid game type. It's one of the eight aesthetics defined by MDA framework. Agency is very, very important in anything where you have like challenge or skill as a primary aesthetic you're going for. But fundamentally, user agency in an interactive piece 
gives a person a feeling of presence into the environment because they feel like I'm there if I could affect something and I see the reaction of my action in the experience. It plants and grounds the user into the experience. This is something that has been developed over the last five years. You know, we're still figuring out what core mechanics are satisfying in VR. And you have some things like Tilt Brush or Beat Saber that have developed VR native mechanics that are very, very satisfying. But you also have some equally satisfying experiences like Dear Angeline and the like, which are very submissive. You're watching an experience unfold and you have no agency and experience. But it's really not about you and those experiences, it's about watching the characters. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Another one I can throw in there is The Great Sea. I don't know if you got a chance to try that. I have not. <laughs> it is an excellent one. Definitely an excellent one that you might want to try. But it's more of a cinematic VR experience where you are definitely very passive and you're just enjoying the story versus participating in it. And I think that passive experience is something that if you work a really hard job nine to five and you come home and you just want to unplug plug and not work. <laughs> Those are great experiences for that. So sometimes users want that kind of passive, not engaged experience. Well, it's really interesting because we had a presentation on writing for VR and the presenter said, and I forget who he quoted somebody, but said that basically older people that have full agency in their life, in fact, they have way too much agency in their life. When they get in VR, they want as little to none agency as possible because they don't want to make decisions. But the reverse, the younger people, for example, when they're going to K through 12 and they're told every day what to do and they have no agency because they have just to follow what people tell them. When they go into gaming, they want full agency because they want to feel in full control. I don't know how true that is, but it does kind of make sense. I think that there is some truth in that because a lot of times if you're always being asked to make decisions, make decisions, make decisions, sometimes there's a certain satisfaction in just kicking back and letting the world pass by. And the thing that really surprised me about virtual reality over the last five years is everyone was really scared of turning couch potatoes into vegetables and just you turn into a drooling idiot with this VR headset on your face and you just never move again. And that actually did not happen. The first time I experienced the vibe with room scale VR, I stood up, I walked around my environment. And this is, I think, of one of the first technologies because it's spatial computing and you interact with it in space. This is one of the first mediums where you're not a passive observer, you're an active participant, which encourages you to get up off the sofa, walk around. And that's really a latent power of VR that we're still exploring and we're still uncovering. Well, people are losing weight with VR, with the different kinds of experiences such as Beat Saber and the hundreds of others that are out there that actually make you stand up and move. And personally, I have tons of agency throughout my life. I still like full agency in a game. I don't want to watch a movie inside of VR. I want a VR experience, which allows me to be in control. I think that's really one of the novelty of VR is it's one of the first mediums where your hands are your mechanics. If you're playing Skyrim and you have a little Xbox controller in your hands, you hit the A button to pick up a sword, that kind of works when you're playing an Xbox. But when you're in virtual reality, you want to lean down and pick that sword up. And grab it, right. And grab it with your hand. And that is such a satisfying feeling of using your physical body as a controller in space. So how do we keep a project on time and on budget? And of course, if you know the perfect answer for that, then you're it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way I have kept projects on time and in budget has always been focusing on the objectives that you define. You have to, again, define who your user is, define what artifact the project creates that achieves the objective of your user, and then have some kind of result you can measure. With the Blue Deep Rescue, we had a really interesting challenge of getting six people to have a shared VR experience, which really is a technical feat in a way, getting six people into the same experience together and not have a crash, not have a problem, have everything be seamless. So just even defining, making sure your definitions of what success looks like are really important to achieving those goals and, and keeping them objective. Then you have to work back to, okay, we have to develop it, but you don't develop it and then suddenly the users has it. You have to make sure you can have a time to test your assumptions. You have to have a post-production phase to polish up your work, remove the rough edges, and you have to constantly test on the way. Test early, test often. If you can bring your user to a desk and play test with Post-it notes, that's fantastic because you're going to find like 10 things you didn't know 
just having a person asking questions and just role playing through what the experience could even be like. So user testing, probably number one thing to make sure you hit your goal, making sure that you have clearly defined goals that you're measurably working towards is the next thing. And then making sure on the backside of the whole thing that you have a little bit of gap in there to fix what you didn't know was going to come up on the project. Because there's always unknown unknowns that will hit you and you have to live a little bit of flex in there to accommodate those. How do you track user testing the results? In other words, like in traditional development, you can use Jira, you can attach screen captures, you can make notes, all that kind of stuff. How do you do that in virtual reality itself? (laughs) Well, VR definitely has some issues because you sometimes don't see with the same fidelity what a user is seeing. Or not just seeing, but experience, right? Because what you see in the mirror display is not the same thing that they're experiencing. With VR, it's not just what they see, it's also what are they experiencing? How do you track that? I like to ask the question at the end of an experience, you know, what is your strongest memory? Kind of get a feel for what their consciousness grabbed hold of and it was holding on to. Because you may know that you had like 15 or 16 different subconscious things that were occurring that were outside the user's perception that collectively could have created that big memory. But you have to really, you know, the post interview really have always gotten a lot out of that. Watching the video, replaying videos of users going through, you get a lot there. How you track that, I mean, we were using Jira for our project, but you know, you could do everything up to putting a heart rate monitor on a person and seeing how excited someone is. And you're right, it's not always just about what is seen. That's only half the experience. You, know, you still also have what's being felt, what's being heard. For our experience, we had a full haptic stage available to us, so we could do a lot of other things from everything from sense to vibration and heat. And all these things had to work, but they had to work slightly below the conscious level of the user. So you know, if they were too aware of, of the haptic, then it, the haptic wasn't actually being effective because you need to create a sense environment. So we're getting pretty close to the end here. Why don't you give us a quick overview of the experience, the blue? Maybe you can talk a little bit about what the desktop version is and how that's different with the LBE version. The desktop experience of the blue came out when HTC Vive first debuted, and it was a product that really was a great introduction to VR, great sensory experience, having an intimate moment with a giant whale. The director was looking to give someone a great scuba diving memory. And the Dreamscape experience that just debuted last month is a collective experience. It's something that you do with your friends, with your family. You go there together and save a whale. There's a narrative. There's a story-driven experience. There's a start, you know, beginning, middle, and end to it. And it's an active experience so that you actually participate in the environment. And, and in some ways, it's the social interaction between the people that really create the virtual experience. It becomes very meaningful to you because you now have a collective memory that you created together. I've tried the desktop version. I think it was my second VR experience I've tried. And I was awed by it, especially when that whale comes up to you and you see that big eye and it's looking at you. It's it's a little bit on the creepy side, scary, but at the same mm-hmm. time, it's just especially the fact that it is room scale and you can walk towards it. It's just an amazing experience. Yeah, I was not the producer on that. That you know, came out early and I you know, joined Weaver last year for the Blue Deep Rescue. And we really wanted to preserve that moment that was created on the original Blue Experience, where you feel a sense of intimacy with this giant animal. And where VR truly shines is communicating huge vistas in your sense of scale. And the size of that animal is so big, you really cannot appreciate it looking at a photograph of it or looking at a movie picture of it. You know, being in virtual space with it and seeing it from head to tail, it blows your mind that something that large could be alive. Can be alive, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like the size of a house. <laughs> but in VR, you definitely feel like you've experienced that. And that's what makes it just amazing. And that's what makes VR amazing. Yeah, you have a memory of it. And this is something interesting about when we were designing assets for the blue, we realized that you cannot make an asset on a 2D screen and expect for it to look right in VR. That old saying that the camera adds 10 pounds or what have you, you know, that's largely a function of the fact that you're looking at a non 3D representation of something on a 2D plane. When you're actually in VR, your proportions become more real. And if you model an asset on a 2D screen, you know, the hands may look right and the heads may look right. But as soon as you get into VR, the head looks too large or you have like potato fingers or what have you on your avatar. So you have to create this round tripping between like actually looking at assets in VR and then actually taking it back to the desktop to fix it. And when you're done, 
you've created this thing that feels and looks natural in virtual reality. It may not look right on your 2D screen, but it's not supposed to look right there. It's supposed to look right in VR. So does that mean, are you designing assets inside of VR? Indeed. Everything that's built, you have to test early, test off, and test it in VR. You have to see what the asset's going to look like on the equipment that it's going to be consumed on. And if the sooner you can get an asset on there, the quicker you'll find. Maybe the texture resolution that you're going for is, is maybe a miss. Maybe you need a, a higher resolution here, a lower resolution there. But you really won't see where that difference lies until you're actually looking at it on the equipment that the user's going to use. So are you using like Oculus Medium or are you talking about designing them like in Maya and then previewing them in VR? Yeah, all of our assets, we build it first in Maya and then we bring them in through Unity and into a VR experience. So you're not using VR apps to design VR assets? VR apps are really good for prototyping, getting buildings up quick. But when it actually comes to like rigging a model, the tools are not in VR yet, unfortunately. They're still 2D tools and it creates an extra layer of work having to move it out of your 2D pipeline, bring the asset into VR, and then evaluating it. But you have to do that. You have to round trip it. If you're actually looking at like the way a fish swims and is the skeleton of that fish correctly moving the right vertices, you have to look at that in VR because on 2D screen, it may look right, but VR doesn't. You want to find that out before you've done the work of incorporating it in the scene. <laughs> right, definitely. Well, Adam, we're pretty much out of time. One last question, which I asked all of my guests, is describe what you want VR to be like in the future. I'm looking forward to a truly VR native computing experience. We have the beginnings of great experiences today, but it's still like computers were in the early 1980s before we had Windows and Mac OS. We were still working with the command line. We haven't actually figured out what native VR interaction and computing really looks like yet. And even though we have some really compelling experiences happening today, I know that when we get to native VR computing, that a whole new horizon of products will be created. A whole new way of utility will work. And then a whole new level of communication will occur. And so for me, what I'm really most looking forward to is, and this is kind of part of my work in multiplayer, how are we going to communicate different in VR? How is VR going to enable a whole new level of engagement with other people. This is so much more than a phone now. We've gone into the level where we are sharing a world together that could be anything we want. Yeah, definitely. So you basically want an OS for VR. Yeah, you know, most of the products we're working on today are slapped on top of 2D operating systems. You look at like the Gear VRs where you accidentally have like your face would ring in VR if someone rings in a phone call, <laughs> you know, so. And the Android operating system is fundamentally built for phones. It's still not built Completely, op even the chipset, you know, the Snapdragon chipset is built first and foremost for phone considerations, not for virtual reality considerations. So, from the hardware all the way up through the OSI stack, every layer along the way, we need to really reevaluate what does this look like if we really built this for spatialized computing versus let's just duct tape together this thing that works great on 2D screens and then layer it on and then, you know, build VR on top of that because you're missing the boat in many ways. And when we start to really have VR native computing top to bottom along the whole stack, it's going to be really impressive, both in terms of what the hardware is capable of, but also what the software is doing for us. The utility of it, what kind of tools we'll have, how we'll be able to communicate, how we'll be able to create and consume. All these things are going to become way better when we're doing them in VR native products. I think Vive is trying to do that with their announcements in CES, the Vive reality system. I think they're trying to make that OS for other devices and themselves. I would do a, a shout out to Richard Stallman at this point that, you know, we have to look at proprietary systems that are built for the creators of the tool versus free systems that are actually built for the users of the tools. Because a hammer is a device of freedom you know, it empowers me as a user. I'm not giving away my rights to use that hammer. That hammer isn't tracking my activity for some kind of advertisement in the future. It's fundamentally a tool for my empowerment. But if you have a proprietary system, you're setting aside the needs of the user for some other need that's secondary to the creators of the program and their process. So we need to have non-proprietary, truly freedom-free software top to bottom along the stack. That could be like, you know, look at like a Linux machine and the Steam machine that has been created as a VR device. Maybe that's the way we got to go. But we're not going to get there until the creators of the products are willing to let their products be commoditized. You got to think about it. Like if I buy a Sony TV, I don't just watch 
Sony movies on it. And if Sony was going to make the operating system for the television, then they would have all kinds of proprietary things in play to shape its usage. But fundamentally, TVs became successful when the technology became boring and commoditized. This is Clay Shirky's perspective on it, that it's not until technology becomes boring that it can actually become socially interesting. Yeah, that's true. That makes a lot of sense. Well, Adam, unfortunately, we're really out of time. If people want to get a hold of you or learn more about you. Probably the best way of getting a hold of me is on Twitter, at Shinkaze, S-H-I-N-K-A-Z-E, is a good way of reaching out to me. Happy to talk about VR with anybody. It's a very exciting field, and there's a lot of opportunity in it. So I invite everybody to explore it. I love your passion about this, man. I really appreciate it. Certainly. And thank you very much for how to create VR. This is a wonderful asset for the community. And as the market grows, I think work like you're doing is only going to become more useful and pertinent. I hope so. And thank you so much for that. Thanks again, Adam. And to the rest of you, I'm glad you were here with us. Just a quick reminder, if you want access to all of our live events, events, tutorials, practice assets, podcast interviews, videos, and more, register for free at howtocreatevr.com. Finally, if you want to attend our live events in virtual reality, join us inside Altspace VR. Just visit howtocreatevr.com forward slash Altspace VR and subscribe to our channel. So until the next episode, I'm Marcelo Lewin. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>